Church Assembly of God. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Um, we just want you to stand while we get ready to worship God. And whatever trials and tribulations you may have had walking in here today, we urge you to leave them at the door and just let go and worship God today because you are free in his name. Amen. Put your hands together as we get ready to sing this song. shadows step out of the grave break into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting where the Spirit of the Lord right here. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Let's be free today. We say, let's right here. Say, dance like the weight has been lifted. You say, dance, dance like the weight has, has been lifted. lifted. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Dance 
light the way. There is freedom where the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the spirit is here. There be freedom. Let there be freedom. is the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Few cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. the song in raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift Him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise You. Oh, we praise You. Oh, we praise You. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. You say. This is what living looks like. Come on, declare it. This is what freedom feels this like. This is what heaven, this is what heaven sounds, sounds like. like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, 
we give praise in the room this morning. We praise you, we praise you. We praise you, we praise you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Let's just reflect on the goodness of Jesus. Let's reflect on what he did for us on Calvary. And at this time, we'll have the men be ready to come forward to pass out the communion this morning. on the goodness of Jesus that unending love that never ending love oh the blood of Jesus the blood we thank you for the blood amen you may be seated as we get ready to take communion together As we get ready to take communion together, I want to read to you from Micah, one of the Old Testament minor prophets. 
chapter 7, verses 18 to 20. And Micah wraps up his vision from God by saying, Who is a God like you? We could meditate on that for a long time. Who is a God like the God that we serve? Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot and you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. We have in this very short passage the main themes about God as he had revealed himself to his people in the Old Testament. That he was a God of holiness and righteousness, which means there must be judgment on sin. But yet that holiness and righteousness is balanced out by his love and his faithfulness. And because of his love and his faithfulness, from the very beginning, God made promises to his people through Abraham, their forefather, and Jacob, who became Israel, that he would always take care of them as they lived for him and that he would always be ready and willing to forgive them of their sins. And he made a way for that to happen. In the Old Testament, it was sacrifices and other things but all of that pointed forward to Jesus Jesus came God himself in the flesh to live that perfect life that we could not live so that when he died on the cross his death could pay the price for our sins and that is what we do when we take communion together we do it in remembrance of what he did for us and in celebration of the fact that he loved us enough that he is willing to not only forgive us of our sins, but to have paid the price for the forgiveness of our sins, that ultimate price through his death on the cross. So let's take our elements today. We have this wafer. And this wafer reminds us of the bread that Jesus took and passed to his disciples in the upper room. And he said, take and eat of this bread. This represents my body, which will be broken for you. Let's thank him for that today. Lord, we thank you today for coming to earth as a human being, to taking on a body, knowing what that would mean, what the end result would be, that your body would be broken and bruised horribly, terribly mistreated. But you were willing to do that for us, to pay the price for our sins. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread together. We also hold this cup that reminds us of the cup that Jesus passed to his disciples in the upper room. He said, take and drink from this. This represents my blood, which will be shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And as I often say, they didn't really fully understand what was going on because it was before the cross. The disciples didn't. But they would be able to look back and know. And so today we are thankful that Jesus shed his blood and gave his life that our sins could be forgiven. You know, in writing about communion, Paul says that we should examine our hearts as we take communion to make sure that everything is right between us and God. If we know Jesus is our Savior, our salvation is secure. But yet, you know, we go through life day by day, dealing with issues, and sometimes things get sideways between us and God. We have a bad attitude. We say something. We do something. We commit sin. But God's word says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we come to him in thanksgiving for his shed blood, let's also examine our hearts and say, God, forgive me and cleanse me afresh and anew. Lord, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood upon the cross and giving your life that our sins could be forgiven. We remember that specifically this morning. And we say thank you. 
Father, shine your light upon our hearts. If there's anything that is not right between us and you, any way, any place in which we're ignoring, Lord God, your will, your plan, your desire, your instructions for us, point it out, Lord God. And we say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Thank you for your promise to forgive as we confess, repent of our sins. Jesus, again, we say thank you. Thank you for shedding your blood that our sins could be forgiven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the cup together. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite you to stand once again as we enter back into worship. There'll be some men coming by to pick up your cups at this time. And make your throne upon our praise here in this place. Have your way. The moment that we see you, you are changed. Show us your glory. Show us your glory and wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. Come on, people of God, let's make that our hearts prayer this morning. That we want to see the glory of Jesus. We want to see the glory of Jesus right here in this room. Let's declare this. Let's say, and here, not by power and not by might, but only by the cross we come alive. And here we're undone. You to show, show us, us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. Show us, God, yeah. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Standing on holy ground, yeah. standing on holy ground. Oh, some chains fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything and lives are healed. My hope is found here and now. Jesus, you change everything. Help me say, chains fall, fear bow. Right here and now, yeah. You change everything. And lives are healed. Your hope is bound. Right here and now. Right here. 
there's fullness of joy in your presence there is life forevermore in your presence in your presence in your presence there is peace in your presence there is joy in your presence there is life oh in your presence your presence in your presence God and I want more and I want more and I want Jesus, I want more. Can we lift that up? Say, I, I want, want more. More of your love. I, I want, want more. more. Say, I want more. I And I want more. Let them hear you this morning. Let them hear you. I want more. I want more. I want. I want more. Jesus, I want. It sounds so sweet in the room. Say I want. I want more. 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 Say. Jesus, I want more. 
Jesus, I want more. Just one more time. Just press in. Say, I want, I want more. I want, I want more. More of you, Jesus, and less of me. I want more. Jesus, I want more. Come on, just worship, just worship right there. Tell him how much you need him this morning. Tell him how much you desire more of his love this morning. Come on, open up your mouth. Oh, I want more, I want more, I want more. I want more, I want more, I want more. Come on, press in, press in, people of God, press in. She's hearing your hearts cry this morning. She's hearing your prayers this morning. Come on, just lift up your voice. He said, anything that we, everything that we need, according to his will, he will provide. Whatever your need is today, would you give it to him? He said he wants to trade our burdens for his because it's lighter. So whatever your burden is today, would you trade it? I want more. I want more. Say, I want more. And I want more. I want more. And I want more. Jesus, I want more. Hallelujah. 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 He is worthy of our praise. He's so worthy of our praise. Father God, I come to you this morning. First, Lord, I just want to ask you, God, to break off this spirit of distraction that is in the house today. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus to release your sweet peace. Father God, Lord, I know you want to do something in the hearts and lives of your people today. But Father, I just sense such a heaviness. Break it off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to come to you in prayer. Lord, we want to lift up those that are in need of a touch from you. God, Sister Dorothy Brown is in the hospital. Heal her in that hospital bed. Give her doctor's wisdom, Lord. God, I pray for Alfred Pal Palantawa. I'm not saying his name right, Lord, but Brother Alfred. God, you know who he is. Lord, touch him, oh God, and as he has that procedure on Tuesday, go before him, Father. Lord, we thank you that Elder Lynn Wedderburn is with us today, but continue to heal him and strengthen his body. And Father, we lift up Veronica Laddie to you today. God, touch her, heal her, strengthen her, and have your will and way in her body and life. Father, we pray for our pastor as he'll be bringing the word in just a few moments. God, speak to him and speak through him. Prepare our ears to hear, our hearts to receive. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. If you have children five years old through fifth grade, you may go to the back door and meet our leaders to go over to the kids' zone. We do have the nursery back in the door back here. And the rest of you go out and shake hands and greet people. God bless.
Good morning, good morning, Moag family. As you make your way back to your seat this morning, we want to do just a couple of things before we get into the word. So as you make your way back to your seat, we want to welcome some visitors with us this morning. We don't want to put anyone out there, make them feel nervous or anything, but we want to welcome you and make sure that you feel welcomed here at our home. So if this is your first, second, or third time here at Moag, Mary Oaks Assembly of God, we want to give you a warm welcome. Moag family, can we give them a warm welcome? Amen. Amen. We just asked a couple of things. If this is your first time here, we ask that you make sure that you stop by our first time guest table out in the lobby so that we can get some information from you and you can get some information from us. Once again, we are so glad that you joined us today. We also want to welcome those that are watching online. If you're watching via, Insta uh, via YouTube or our Facebook or our church website, welcome and thank you for joining us. We ask that down below in the comments that you put where you're watching and also any prayer requests so we can be praying for and with you. Moik family, can we give them a warm welcome as well? We're not able to see you, but you're seeing us, and we're so glad that you are worshiping and receiving the word just the same way we are. Amen. Amen. Before we move on with our service, I just want to make one quick announcement. The night of worship that we've been announcing has been postponed from April 21st. So we'll no longer be on April 21st. It'll, we have not uh, given the date, so it's um, to TBD. There we go, to be determined. Uh, so if you are uh, looking forward to worshiping and have that worship night, um, just letting you know it is postponed, and we will let you know when that date is back on. God bless you. Good morning, for a little while longer, amen. I'm going to interrupt our regularly scheduled programming for just a moment. I say that so our tech team doesn't go, where's he going, what's he doing? So, How many of you had a great week this week? Good, good. How many had some confusing, disrupting week, things this week? Yes, and some of you had both, right? That's true for me. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm just going to be real open and honest here right now. Uh, this morning, ever since I got up this morning, I've uh, been pre finished preparing my, uh, my thoughts and my focus and all that kind of stuff, looking at the service and all that kind of, got some great things going on. We've already had communion together, wonderful, worship God, and got some other things, things coming up besides God's word. But there's just been this kind of battle in my, in my, not in my heart, but in my mind. It just felt like the enemy was attacking in an extra strong way. And when I came in, I found out, I don't know all the details, but I know that they were having some troubles with the video projectors this morning, some other tech things, and they're, they're struggling with that. And even in the service today, I don't know if it's true for you. If this is not true for you, I say, yay you, that's great. But I've just sensed in my spirit this kind of disturbance, this, this thing. And so if you have felt that in your own personal life or you felt that here this morning, I just want to let you know, you know, every time we gather together, the enemy wants to oppose. You know that? Yeah. So I just wanted to pause for just a second and just say, God, we're trusting in you. And whatever the enemy wants to try to do, we're just going to resist him and we're going to go forward for you. Amen? Let's do that right now. Yes. Yes. Father God, we just come to you and say, God, we just want to worship you and we want to please you. And God, we've gathered in your name today. And Lord, it just seems like the enemy's trying extra hard to get a number of us. I don't know how many of us sidetracked and off base and off balance or whatever it might be. Lord God, he's trying to throw all kinds of stuff in the mix. But God, we just reject whatever he wants to do and say, God, may you be glorified and help us to experience your love and your joy and your peace as we continue to go forward in this service. And Lord, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to take up the offering today. So I'm going to invite our men to come. As they come, I was just thinking about the offering today, and I was thinking about giving. And the first verse that came to my mind doesn't have to do with us giving, but it has to do with God giving. A verse that's probably more well-known than almost any other verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but he have eternal life. 
God gave his son, as we celebrated in communion, that we might have life, that we could have a relationship with him. God is a giving God, and he encourages us to be giving also. We want to thank you for all of your faithfulness in giving. And so today, at this time, we're going to be taking up our offering. Many of you give online. That's great. Many of you give as you come in in the box on the back of the wall. You're welcome to continue to do that. But we pause for just a moment to say thank you, God, for the way you've blessed us, what you've given to us, and we now give back to you in thanksgiving. Lord, thank you again for giving your son. Thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you put into our lives. So right now, Lord, we give back to you an offering in response to your instructions and what you ask of us, but also out of a grateful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As they take up the offering today, pay attention to the screens for our announcement video. Good morning, Moed family. We're so glad you joined us today. If you have offering today, we have many ways to give. You can give in the QR code at the bottom of the screen. You can give in the black box at the back of the sanctuary on your way in or on your way out. You can give as the men are passing around the offering bags. You can mail it in or you can drop it by the office during the week. Here's what's coming up at Moab. On April 27th, we are going on a spring dinner cruise. And so if you're interested in going, please make sure you sign up in the lobby and see the information in the bulletin for what times you need to be here. Our Section 4 men's ministry is having a breakfast in our section on May 9th at 9 a.m. We will be heading to United Faith Assembly of God. So if you're interested in going, come out and fellowship with us. Make sure you take a look at the bulletin to see all the information you need to know about that event. Save the day, ladies. Women of Character is having a ladies retreat titled The Purpose is in God's Plan on Friday, May 10th and Saturday, May 11th. Times are in the bulletin. Young adults, we are having a young adult unwind bowling party on Friday, May 3rd at 7 p.m. right there at the bowling alley on the end of Easy Street. We're looking forward to having a, an amazing time with some food and fellowship. And you can also bring your kids. We'll have a lane for them as well. We encourage you to join us on Wednesday nights for our family night services. We have services for all ages. For kids, k Power Kids Praise on Wednesdays, they meet in Building B in the Fellowship Hall. An adult service meets in the main sanctuary in Building B at 7 o'clock. And youth meet at 6 p.m. right here in Building A for dinner, and our service is at 7 p.m. And lastly, if you have FOMO, fear of missing out, sign up for our weekly bulletin in the lobby, and you can get it right in your email. Today, Pastor Tim, our senior pastor, is continuing in our sermon series. Are you ready for the word? We pray that you enjoy the service and you receive something that you can take and apply to your life. God bless. All right, in just a few moments, not quite yet, we're going to be looking at God's Word. And if you want to be prepared and turn to the place that we're going to be looking at, you can turn to Acts chapter 2 and Matthew 28, two specific passages that we are going to be looking at today. Acts chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 28. However, this morning, we have the privilege of doing something really special that we love doing, and we just do it every once in a while. And that is we have the privilege and the opportunity to dedicate a baby to the Lord. I'm going to invite D'Angelo and Melanie Meredith to come. They're bringing Amelia, Melanie, Meredith. And I'm going to ask my wife, Pastor Jan, to join us. And uh, while they're on their way, this is a new young couple. They've been in the area just for, a, I believe, a short time. Because of work schedules, they've not been able to worship with us on Sunday mornings. But hopefully that's going to be changing very, very soon. So they're getting everything together and heading this way. All right. Can we just welcome this young couple to our service this morning? Come on up. Come on up. All right. Come right over here. 
couple of comments here. Psalm 127.3 tells us that children are a heritage from the Lord. And that word heritage can also mean gift or blessing or reward. And we know that's true. They may cause us headaches and heartaches from time to time, but they are a blessing. I mean, we're just being honest, right? I mean, we're trying to be honest all morning. And it is true that children are a reward. They're a special gift from the Lord bringing great joy. But they're also a very important responsibility, especially for parents. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. God's word even gives us instructions on how we should do that. In Deuteronomy 7, God tells his people, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So he tells his people, especially in the home, that God's word should be something that's in their minds but also in their hearts. Something that they know but they also live out. Something that's a part of their everyday life from the time they get up in the morning till the time they go to bed at night and something that they communicate to each other and especially to their children. The responsibility of parents to their children is very clear. Parents are to teach their children about God to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and they're to provide a family life and a climate within their home that will be best for that child to grow up to love and serve the Lord. So as I say, we have this couple here today who have brought their child to be dedicated and to dedicate themselves to this responsibility. D'Angelo and Melanie Meredith bringing Amelia Melody Meredith. All right. By bringing Amelia to be dedicated to the Lord, D'Angelo and Melanie are following a scriptural parent, uh, pattern. We see all through scriptures many parents giving their children to the Lord. And this includes Mary and Joseph, who brought Jesus up to the temple to be dedicated to him and to present him to the Lord. And it's so important that parents take the time to do that, to dedicate their child to God and to dedicate themselves to the task of raising him or her according to God's word. I get to hold her now. This is my favorite part. Okay. The part that probably makes every parent nervous. Can you see her? She is so bright and awake. I've dedicated babies that were asleep. I've dedicated babies that were squalling. This is the best kind right here. They're all good. They're all good. You know what God's word says, and this is true for all of us, but today we're looking at Amelia. God's word says that he has a purpose for her life. And if she finds it and lives it, she'll have success. But if she refuses it or ignores it, she may have success as far as the world is concerned, but ultimately failure. And so to Angela and Melanie, I'm telling you, your responsibility is to raise her in such a way that she will come to know what God's plan is for her life and choose to follow after him. And so I challenge you to do that today. So, to Angela and Melanie, I ask you, do you present Amelia Melanie Meredith in solemn dedication to the Lord today? Okay. Do you promise to bring her up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Do you promise to live examples of a godly, consistent life and provide a home life that will lead her at the earliest possible age, they have the opportunity to know Jesus as her Savior. All right. I'm going to ask Pastor Jan to pray for you two before we pray for Amelia. Father God, we thank you for this precious couple and this precious little baby girl. We ask you, Lord God, to put a hedge of protection around their home, around their family life. Lord God, I pray for D'Angelo and Melanie that you would just use them to be a godly example to this precious little Amelia, Lord God. Father, meet their every need, protect them, bless them, encourage and strengthen them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray for Amelia. God, we come to you and we thank you for this life. It is a blessing, Lord God. We thank you for these parents that have a desire that she come to know the Lord, Lord God. We pray that you would continue to keep her in health, 
that you keep her strong, safe, and healthy, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally and spiritually and in every other way. God, we pray that as she grows older, that she would grow strong and do well in every endeavor of life. May she come to know you at an early age and live for you all the days of her life, Lord God. And Father, we just thank you and praise you for hearing our prayers today. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I dedicate Amelia Melanie Meredith to God and to his service. Amen. Amen. Here you go to Angela. You got her? All right. God bless you, sir. All righty. God bless you. You may go down. All right. It's always a lot of fun to dedicate babies. You know, we get couples that call and say, hey, we want to have our baby dedicated. And I said, I always tell them. I said, why? Because the thing is, is we have no desire to do it just as a tradition. It's not a bad tradition. It's a good tradition. But for me, dedicating a child means I want this child to know God. And if I want this child to know God as a parent, then that means I got to know God. And so I only dedicate babies for parents to say, that's my heart, that's my desire, and I want to raise my kid to know God. So anyway. All right. Well, hopefully you have found our text for today. If you were here last week, you may remember that I had a little bit of trouble. My uh, iPad didn't want to switch over to my sermon notes. We're under control today. I didn't find out why I did that. I will tell you this, that after the service was all over, we got done praying, I came up here, picked up my iPad, and my notes popped right up. I think God was just wanting to stretch me last week, so amen. Today, we're going to continue on in the sermon series I started last week. And I'm going to start off not with a question this time, but show you a picture. A couple of years ago, my wife's aunt gave her a lemon tree. But at that time, it was hard to call it a lemon tree because it looked like a stick stuck in the ground. And to be honest with you, I thought it looked mostly dead, except it had a lemon hanging on it. So apparently, however they do this, they cut it off of a bigger lemon tree, stuck it in the ground, and did it in such a way that it stayed alive. And we, <laughs> you know, neither my wife and I have green thumbs, not really. And so we were figuring, how are we going to do this? So we did a lot of research online about what do we need to do to keep this lemon tree alive? Where do we need to plant it in the yard so it gets the right sun? You know, all this stuff. And so we planted it in the yard. And over the last about two years or so, We've tried to give it the fertilizer on the schedule it's supposed to have the fertilizer. We watered it every day at first and then tried to do, make sure it got plenty of, of rain and all that kind of stuff. And so yesterday we took this picture of the lemon tree. It turned into a stick, from a stick into this, it looks like a bush. And this year we were so excited because it got blooms on it. Had never seen that before. And then all of a sudden, those blooms got these little bulbous things forming at the bottom. It's like, are those actually lemons? And go on to the second picture that shows some close-up of some lemons that are forming. They look like limes because they're green. But they're actually lemons. And this little bush-like lemon tree right now has about 30 lemons on it that are growing. And it's like, man, pretty awesome. Now, I wanted to use this as an illustration to talk for a moment about what causes a plant to grow and be healthy. And I already referred to that. I said that when we got the lemon stick, <laughs> lemon tree, we, planted, we did some research and we came to find out that, you know, in our part of the country, um, anyway, it needs to be planted in a place where it gets like this much sunlight, you know, and there's certain nutrients that it has to have. And if your soil doesn't have it, you need to put the right fertilizer on there and it has to be the right amount at the right time and so we made note of that and 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 so uh, every three months I'd go out there and put the uh, get a little measuring cup and measure just how much it's supposed to have and put it there and and water it you know because every plant is different but they all need similar things they need sunlight and some need more than others some need less than others or you're going to burn them up they need most of them anyway soil and it needs to have the right nutrients in that soil and if it doesn't have the right nutrients automatically you need to add it and even if it does have the right nutrients at the beginning you might need to add more because it's going to use them up it needs water and each plant's different for how much water some need a lot more some need a lot less there's a number of different things that are necessary for a plant to be healthy and the same thing is true for us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ 
And the same thing is, us, is true for us as a body of believers, as a church. And as I mentioned last week, we started this new sermon series that'll take us through toward the end of May called Growing a Healthy Church. Growing a Healthy Church. I couldn't help but think of a real short verse in 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3.18, where Peter encourages his readers, believers in Jesus, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You need to grow in his grace, you know, the the gracious relationship that we can have with him through Jesus Christ, but grow in knowledge. And that's not just knowledge of facts about Jesus, but that word means knowledge of actually knowing him. So we have this exhortation to grow. We have lots of exhortations and encouragements in scripture to not only grow, but to be healthy to use a different kind of um, picture, to be mature, to not be babies. You know, we just dedicated the baby. Love babies, you know, in spite of the things that can maybe frustrate us. You know, we love the babies even though we could do without having to change the diapers. We love the babies even though we could do without the crying that doesn't want to stop sometimes. We, we love the babies although we could really benefit from a full night's sleep. But we know that's part of the process, right? You know, they're going to grow up eventually. But how would you feel if you came to a church dinner and you got a couple with a little baby and everybody's, ooh, and all those are cute and all that kind of stuff. And the baby put them in a high chair and you got to feed them and, oop, got to take them to the nursery, take care of that little problem, you know, on the other end of where you feed them. And, you know, maybe they cry a little bit, but everybody understands because that's a baby. But on the other side of the room... You've got a 35-year-old adult male trying to sit in a high chair with a big bib on, crying out, feed me, feed me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even going to paint that picture anymore. You know, we expect that eventually somebody's going to grow up, right? But we've got to do that spiritually too. We need to grow up spiritually. So as we talk about growing a healthy church, how can we as a church grow and be healthy? How can we as individual followers or believers in Jesus Christ grow and be healthy? And as I mentioned last week, they're totally interrelated. The growth and health of our church is based on the growth and health of the people that make up this church. And our church should form a very important part of how you grow And become more healthy in your relationship with Jesus Christ if you have one. And if you happen to be here today or you're watching online and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I believe God has you watching or have you here today because he wants you to have one. So how can we do that? We're going to be taking a look at Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 to 47. And this is the passage or the text for our whole series Because this is a description of what the first church was like, what it was involved in, what it did that helped it to grow, that made it healthy or growing more and more healthy all the time, that enabled them to reach out to people around them so that they could come to know Jesus. So let's read that right now. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. It says, and they, talking about all the believers in the church, the first church, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We have here a description of a growing and healthy church with at least some of what I believe some of the most significant aspects of those things that enabled them to grow and enabled them to be healthy. Last week, we just talked about the whole idea of being devoted because that's how this passage starts. It says, and they devoted themselves. 
And they got a list of things they devoted themselves. But they devoted themselves. And we talked about the meaning of devotion and how devotion talks about being committed to something, being passionate about something, being willing to sacrifice for. And how we need to be devoted to God and his plans and his purposes for our life and for our church. That was last week. If you missed it, you can go back and watch it or listen to it later. But today we want to jump in and look at the first item here. But what are the items that we see in here? First of all, we see that the early church was devoted to truth. And we're going to talk about that today. We see that when it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. We see that the early church was devoted to fellowship. And I mentioned last week that fellowship is not just getting together for a church potluck. It is all about relationship with each other and with God and how our relationships with each other affect our relationship with God and vice versa and all those things that we have in common in spite of the many things that we don't have in common. We'll talk about that next week. We see that the early church was devoted to worship. That word is not used in here, but yet descriptions are there. And by worship, we don't mean just that they had a really good worship band and they sang a lot and they lifted their hand. You know, those are all aspects of worship, but worship means Together as a body, giving glory and honor to God and helping him to know that we recognize that he is worthy. That's where worship comes, worthy. That he is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. We see it in this passage when it says that they had the breaking of bread, which referred to sharing meals together, but also communion. When it talks about the prayers and how they attended the temple together because the temple had great courtyards where people could gather in groups to learn and to grow and to experience teaching. How it talked about how they met in their homes. I mentioned last week that there were no established church buildings until about 250 is the earliest one they can find. And even then it didn't become a normal thing for a church to have their own building until about 300 AD. They met in the temple and they met in homes and they met in other public places for worship. It says they were praising God. The early church was devoted to prayer. We see that listed here. And we see that the early church was devoted to compassion. That word's not in here also, but yet that's one of the words that's most often used to describe Jesus and something he wants to see in our lives, that we really care about each other to the degree that we want to help each other out however we can to see each other's needs met. And that's described in here also about how when they saw people that were in need, if they had to, they'd sell some extra property they had. You know, some people have tried to use that verse to, to support communism and all that kind of thing. You need to sell everything and live in a commune. That's not what's described here. It's just basically saying that if you had and somebody else didn't, you'd do the best you could to help those that didn't. Okay, and we'll talk about that one week, about having compassion. And we see that the result is awe. God showed up and did wonders and signs. And many, many more people came to know Jesus. And so this is how a church grows. This is how a believer grows. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you are growing in him, you're becoming more healthy, chances are you're involved in these things to a degree. And my purpose for preaching this sermon series is that we as a church will take a look at where we're at and what we're doing and maybe what we're not doing and what we're not doing so good. I can tell you we're not a perfect church. There are no perfect churches. But how can we improve? But I challenge each and every one of you to look at your own life, your own relationship with God to see how you're doing in each of these areas. Sometimes we've got an area where we're really strong and then we're weak in another one. Let's work on balancing those things out. So today we're going to be taking a look at the first one, devoted to truth. Devoted to truth. In Acts 2.42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. Who were the apostles? They started out as disciples. A disciple is a learner, a follower, and Jesus called those 12 men to be disciples. They were learners. They were followers. They were with Jesus. It wasn't just like a teacher-student thing. It was that. But in their day and age, if you wanted to be a disciple of someone, you didn't just go to class, you know, once a day for five days and take the weekends. You spent all the time you could with your teacher, with your rabbi. You would not only hear what they had to say about the truth, but you saw how they lived their life. Your goal was not just to learn what they could teach you with your knowledge, but you wanted to become like them because you saw something in their life that you wanted to emulate. And in Jesus' case, 
His disciples were with him and traveled with him and were involved in ministry with him and he taught them and he trained them and he, he, he let them do things and sent them out to do things. And so those disciples became apostles, which means sent ones. And so it says here that in the early church, one of the things that helped them grow, one of the things that helped them mature is that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. In other words, it was important to them. They were committed to it. They were passionate about it. They were willing to sacrifice for it. Don't you wish that we could know what the apostles' teaching was? Did you all go to sleep? You would say, we do. And if you said that, you're right. We know what the apostles' teaching was. It's very, very clear. You know, we could read that and say, oh, I wish I could have sat in the temple courtyard. You know, that place where the believers gather again and hear Peter talk about, you know, the stuff that he experienced with Jesus or hear John or James or one of the others. I wish we could do that. But you know what? We can, maybe not from their lips. I want to go to the second passage that I asked you to turn to a little while ago, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 we have Jesus talking to his disciples and the other people that have been gathered at some point shortly before he ascends into heaven. And Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We often focus on these verses to talk about how God wants to use us in our world to reach people for Jesus. And that certainly is one of the main focuses that are here. But Jesus tells his disciples that as they go out and share the good news with the people that God leads them to around them, but around the world, their goal is not just to make converts. You know, share the truth with them, give them to say a prayer, and go on to the next one. But to make disciples. In other words, to help them begin to follow Jesus like they chose to follow Jesus. And how were they to do that? Well, he says when they make the commitment, baptize them because that's the public declaration of the, of the commitment they made. He says, but a key factor of that is to teach them to observe all that Jesus had taught them. He says, all that I've commanded you. And he says, you go out and teach everybody what I taught you. And again, it's not just the mental, informational knowledge, but it's the, the lifestyle. So when we see that that's what Jesus called them to do, we can only assume that that's what they were doing. We have no reason to believe they weren't. They didn't make up their own stuff. They were teaching what God, what Jesus had taught them. And so when it says in Acts 2 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, they were devoting themselves to what the apostles were telling them about what Jesus had done in their life and what he had taught them and the truths that he had given them and the lifestyle that he had trained them to live. So you know what? We can know what their teaching is because we have it in our Bibles. You see, that's what the Bible's all about. We have the Gospels in the New Testament, which is the four stories of Jesus' life that includes his activities, facts about his life, what he did, what he said, what he taught. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have Jesus' direct teachings in what he did. And so we know that the apostles taught that. In fact, that's what led to the writing of the Gospels. Matthew was one of the disciples, and he wrote down his own Version of what when I say version, I mean it's my own perspective. All of them agree together, but they're different perspectives. And then Mark, he wasn't one of the original disciples, but yet he was a helper of Peter. And many believe that what Mark wrote down was Peter's recollections of Jesus' life. And I say recollections, Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would give them perfect memory to be able to remember what they needed to share and to, with, the, with the people that followed along behind. And you have Luke, he was with Paul. And then, of course, you have John, who also was one of the apostles. You have the Gospels that share with us what Jesus said and what he did. And then you get into the book of Acts. 
And in the book of Acts, you have sermons that the apostles preach. So you got some more teaching there, but you also see how their teaching and their preaching impacted their lives and the lives that God sent them to. And then you have the epistles. Contrary to some people's belief, the epistles were not the wives of the apostles. The word epistle means letter. And so we have all these letters by Paul and Peter and James, the other apostles. And so in there we have more teachings of what Jesus had shared with them, but also more information he gave them about how it should impact their lives and their relationship with God. It'd be very easy to look at it and say, well, that shows how important the New Testament is, and that is very, very true. But what about the Old Testament? Can we just throw the Old Testament out? No, it provided the foundation for everything else. In fact, if you want to go back later and read Luke chapter 24, it talks several places in there, says several places in there how after Jesus rose from the grave, he would spend time with his disciples and he would show them from the Old Testament, their Bible, how he was a fulfillment of everything God was doing. So there's great value in the Old Testament too because it lays the foundation for Jesus' coming and everything that he taught and he did. So we got the whole Bible there. So when we talk about how the early believers and how we today should be devoted to the truth, we're talking about God's word. We're talking about the Bible. Now I understand that all through history and especially today in our culture and in our world, there's all these questions that came about. Is this thing called the Bible really God's word? And there's a lot of people say, no, it isn't. It's just a bunch of stuff written by men, collected over centuries and all that kind of stuff. So you can't trust it. It's not reliable. It may have some good things to say. And I just want to tell you that that is a very real question. That is a very real issue that we're not going to deal with today because I can't deal with that and also share what I believe God wants us to hear today. But I do want to mention that because if you are here today or you're watching online or you're listening to this at some other time and that is a question that you are wrestling with, how can we know that the Bible really is God's word? How can we know that it's not just a bunch of stuff written by a bunch of people and somebody stuck it all together? How can we even know that what we have today is still accurate and reliable since most of it was written at least 2,000 years ago and it's been passed down through history and people love to say oh and then the process has got all kinds of mistakes and stuff can I tell you that there are very good solid facts and reasonable answers to all those things and things that God said and did in the process to guard and safeguard his word. And we talked about that last year in a Wednesday night Bible study series that I did called Answering Tough Questions. We dealt with a lot of different tough questions, but the first three, four, five lessons were all on God's word and how we can have confidence that it truly is God's word and it has been preserved for us through the last 2,000 years so that we can know that God's word that we hold in our hands, whether it's an actual book or it's on a device or however it is that we can know that it's accurate and it is God's word. So I just say all that, not as a commercial, but if you wrestle with those things or know someone who does, you can go back and listen to those from last summer on our website, okay? Or if you want to talk about it, I'll sit down and talk to you about it. But today, I want to go based on the fact that most of us, I believe anyway, here in this room, know that to be true, that the Bible is God's word. And because it's God's word, it has authority and it has reliability. So I want us to pick apart a couple things that are said in this passage from Matthew and bring out a couple of encouragements from us to help us grow as followers of Jesus in our interaction with God's word, in our interaction with the truth. And I want to follow that before we get done with some very, very practical suggestions on what you can do to see that happen in your life, okay? So let's jump into these couple of encouragements, three encouragements from this passage to help us grow as followers of Jesus and be devoted to the truth. The first one is this, is learn the truth. Learn the truth. If you're here today, you're in that process right now because I'm communicating some of God's truth to you. Unless you came to take a nap or you're not paying attention or whatever, you're in the position to learn some truth. But that needs to be the goal and the plan and the idea and the, and, and, and the focus of our lives is that we want to learn God's truth. When Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples, he says, teaching them 
teaching them all that I have commanded you. So if you got teachers, you should have learners. All right? And God's word has so much to offer to us. It's not just a story of God's interactions with humanity through history and how he sent Jesus. It is all of that. But God's word speaks to every significant issue, every significant problem, every significant priority of our lives and gives us God's perspective and gives us what is right and what is wrong. I know that's not politically correct. You know, even talking about truth like there really is a set truth out there doesn't gel well with our society because our society says, well, truth is kind of really, it just kind of is flexible. You know, everybody has their own truth and that may be true for some minor areas of life, but can I tell you the truth is truth. Two plus two is always going to equal four. And can I tell you that God is God. And he created the world and he created the human race and he knows what he's doing. And he knows what's best for us. And it's only as we learn his truth and live it out that we can experience his best for us and avoid so many pitfalls and problems. Talk a little bit about, more about that later. Because, But first of all, we've got to learn the truth. We've got to learn the truth. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman, included in there, of God may be complete equipped for every good work that word complete maybe can also be mature so he deliberately links us together that paying attention to God's word and implementing it in our lives is what's going to lead us to growth and maturity he uses a number of words there that is profitable teaching reproof correction training and rights we're not digging too deeply into those but basically it, it, it tells us what we can believe how we can live both the positive side and the negative side and as I said before, God created us. He knows how we work. We really ought to pay attention to what he says. Really ought to learn that. I don't know about you, but for me, if I've got a device, an appliance or whatever, a lawnmower, whatever, and something's not going right, true human nature is, well, I'll play with this and I'll play with that, see if I can get it to work. But you know what's even better? Go to the owner's manual. You know? Or watch a YouTube video of somebody that knows what they're talking about because they know the owner's manual. I can't tell you how many times because I don't even know that I had a problem or whatever and I just tried to tinker with it and, you know, sometimes you get lucky and it's simple and, oh, it got, it got fixed. But many times, like, nope, forget that. So I dig out, I got this box. I keep all of our appliance manuals and stuff like that. You know, we buy something new, just toss the instruction booklet in the box. So someday if I need it, I can go pawn through there and find it, you know. Many times I've done that to keep my lawnmower running better, you know, or, or to take care of this problem or that problem. Or if I don't have that, I go on YouTube and say, hey, what about this? And thankfully, we got all this information at our, at, our, at, our web, at, our, at our fingertips. But you know what? We've got all that for our life in God's word. We need to learn it. God's word contains the truth for what's right and what's in our best interest in every area of our lives. God's word speaks to areas of our relationships and of our finances and of our sexuality and of um, how we interact with other people in a, the most positive way, how we deal with problems in our relationships and these other areas of life. How we can succeed, how we can have peace, how we can have love, how we can have joy. Something that most everybody's really looking for. God's word has instruction for that. But you know, God's word is not just information to help us, but it's the key to our relationship with him. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. So we need to learn the truth. But we need to not only learn the truth, we should live the truth. And I've already alluded to that. I've already kind of, because it's kind of hard to separate those two things, but we need, we need to live it out. You know, I just used an illustration a moment ago about if I got a problem with my lawnmower, so 
the solution wherever I find it, if I say, oh, good, I'm glad to know how to fix that, and I don't fix it, what good does it do? But how many times do we as a believer maybe come to a service or a Bible study or another group where we're talking about God's word or, or it's preached or taught or we're listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video or something and God's truth is coming into our life and we don't do anything about it. We need to not only learn the truth, we need to live the truth. In that passage in Matthew 28, when Jesus told his disciples what to do, he says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. To observe means not just to see, but to live out. Share with them everything I've taught you, but share with them how to live it out. We need to live the truth. James tells us in James 1.22, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If you read that, you know, that whole section of that chapter, he says, you know, if you just listen to God's word and, and you take it in, but you don't do anything about it, it's like you go look in a mirror in the morning and your hair is a mess and, and, and you know, everything's just, a, you maybe got a big old pimple on your face or something like that. And you look at it and say, oh, that looks terrible. And then you just turn around and go out throughout your day without doing anything about it. I know none of you ladies did that this morning. Hopefully the guys took a little time to try to be presentable. But we're to be doers of the word, not just hearers only, because if we're hearers only, we're deceiving ourselves if we think it makes a difference. Jesus had a lot of opportunities to teach, and, and one of the most well-known and condensed portions is Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, and he gives a lot of great instructions for his followers in there, and he wraps it all up with this parable, and it's found in Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. I'm just going to read the first line. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And he tells this story, which many of you may be familiar with, but he says the, the wise man builds his house upon a solid foundation so that when the rains come and the water washes down, it stands firm. But a foolish man builds his house upon the sand. And when the rains fall and the waters come, it washes out the foundation and the house collapses. Such a wonderful picture of our lives. He says, if you want to be wise, you'll listen to what I have to say, but then you'll live it out. You'll do it. That will help your life to remain firm when the storms come. The storms are going to come. The waves are going to, the winds are going to come. The rain is going to beat against it. You may wonder, is it going to stand? He says, but if it's based upon what I've told you and you're living that out, you will stand firm. But if you don't, things can collapse. So we need to learn the word, learn the truth, but we need to live the truth. Just to give another example, it's, it's knowing what you need to do to be in good health, diet, exercise, whatever it might be, but yet not doing it. Your, your health does not change. We all struggle with that, don't we? Before I move on to the next one, I just want to say this, that if we get to that point, and I hope we all are, or I know most of us are, I know I am, I want to live it out. I don't want to just learn it, I want to live it. I want to encourage you to not do what is so easy to do. And that is to pick and choose. What do I mean by that? Well, I know that God tells me through his word that I should do this, 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 and this. Well, these ones are pretty easy, so I'm going to do those. This one's kind of hard, so maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know if I agree with that one. So I think I'll just focus on all these over here and let that one go. We don't get to pick and choose. We shouldn't pick and choose. We need to overcome that reluctance in our heart because chances are the one that we want to ignore, the one that we want to say it's not that big a deal, the one that we want to say, well, it's okay that if I still do that thing because I'm doing all these other things, chances are that's the thing that God is really trying to speak to us about because that's the main thing that's keeping us from all of his blessings and all of that closeness of relationship that he wants for us to have. So I just pause right here. 
to challenge you like I challenge myself and I have been this week Lord what is the area or what are the areas that I've been kind of pushing to the side what are the areas where you've been speaking to my heart and I've been kind of like just glossing over it and I feel kind of comfortable because I know I got all these other areas under control what is that area of my life where I'm not pleasing you and it's quite clear in your word what are the areas in which I'm giving in to what our culture says and saying, well, you know what God says about it? Yeah, but he didn't understand what culture is going to be like today. God's truth is eternal, and it's all important. So we need to learn the truth. We need to live the truth in all of it. And then the third one is love the truth. Love the truth. You know, when Jesus told them, he says to go and make disciples. And this brings me back to something I mentioned earlier. It's not just about studying God's word, being in an environment like this where I can learn more about it. And even it's not just about doing that so that I can keep all these rules and principles and commandments and I can check them off my checkbox. It all leads to this final goal and that is that all those things are so we can have a relationship with God. And when I say love the truth, I'm talking about love God's truth that leads us into a loving relationship with a God who loves us. Jesus says, go and make disciples. A disciple, as I already explained, is not just someone who's learning something from a teacher. It's someone who is walking with that teacher. It's someone who's living with that teacher. It's someone who's trying to become more like them and who is building a strong, solid relationship with that teacher. And that is our goal. It's not just to learn more facts to stuff up here. It's not just to have a checklist that we can make sure that we're doing the right thing and not doing the wrong thing. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were good at both of those things, but they totally missed out because they didn't take that third step to truly love God and love people. I read at the beginning of my message, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I mentioned how that word for knowledge is not just facts. It's to really know someone. It's to really know someone. Not just knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus himself. You know, you can learn a lot of facts about people without ever meeting them. But it's a whole different thing to meet them and develop a relationship with them. And that's what God calls us to do. I want to encourage you, if you want to dig more deeply into this week, to read Psalm 119. Psalm 119 has a reputation it's a very unique chapter. We're not going to read it today in case some of you are thinking about turning there. You're welcome to turn there. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. 176 verses. And the whole psalm is all about God's word. God's communication to his people. He uses a lot of different words for it. He talks about God's word, God's law, God's decrees, God's principles. I mean, you can read through. You can make a list of a bunch of different words used about how God communicated with his people and throughout the whole thing the psalmist is just saying the reason it's so long the reason there's so much there is because of this tremendously positive impact that God's word has had in his life but in God's people's lives and it's not a drudgery thing of oh I gotta spend time with God's word and I gotta pay attention to this and I gotta do this he uses words like God's word is a delight. In fact, I think that word is used more throughout that whole psalm to describe God's word than anything else. He talks about how he has a longing to know God's word, that he seeks it out, that he loves it, that God's word is better than wealth, that in a poetic way, it's very sweet. He talks about how it's wonderful because of its impact on a person's life and relationship with God. There's one really important fact that I want to leave you with today, and pretty quickly we're going to jump into some practical applications of this. And this one fact, I've told you many times before, because I just want you to get this. God wants to speak to you every day. I believe that with all my heart. God wants to speak to me every single day. The thing is, is am I going to listen? But he doesn't want to speak to you just to give you more information and knowledge. 
He doesn't want to speak to you just to tell you what you're doing wrong and commend you and encourage you for what you're doing right, but to build that relationship. I can think back to when I went to college and um, I took a lot of notes in class and I'd go back and reread those notes, but it wasn't necessarily because I just love reading my notes from class. It's because I knew they were important for me to learn the subject, pass the tests, all that kind of stuff. But there were some other notes that I had that I loved and I'd read them over and over and over again. And those were the notes that Pastor Jan gave me. And I wrote her some too. After we met each other, started dating, we'd write notes back to each, forth to each other, you know? Those notes were special. That's kind of the way it is with God and His Word, the way it should be. God wants to speak to you every day. And we should have motivation to spend time in God's Word, not because we have to, not because we're told to, not because it's the right thing to do, or not just because of those reasons, but because we are able to hear from a close friend, a father who cares about us, who wants what's best for us, who wants our relationship to grow, and he wants to help us with any and everything we might possibly face. But we got to learn to listen. One of the verses in Psalm 119, verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The law being one of those words for God's word. You know, this tells me what I've seen to be true, that God's word is full of wonderful, wondrous things. But it also tells me I need his help to see them. The psalmist is saying, God, help me to see them. And I, I pray that all the time. You know, when I sit down to have my time with God, everybody say, God, help me to, to see what you want me to see in your word. Open it up, to open up my understanding, you know. Use it to encourage me. Use it to challenge me. Use it to draw me closer to you. And you know what? God answers. God answers that prayer. Now, I'm going to say something that might sting a little bit, but that's okay. I'll stand by it. Saying that we love God... And we want a relationship with God, but we don't spend time with his word is like saying that we love someone deeply, whether it's our spouse, our girlfriend, boyfriend, a family member, saying we love them deeply and we want them to get to know them better, but we never spend time with them. We never talk to them on the phone. We never read their emails, their texts or whatever. We have no contact, no real community, but I really love them. How can that really be true of our relationship with God? We say we really love him, but we don't want to hear from him. We don't want to spend time with him. Again, if that hurts a little bit, I, my challenge, my, my prayer is that God uses that to encourage you to get back on a better track rather than go away discouraged. So I just want to give you some practical suggestions. There's eight of them. You're saying, Pastor Tim, eight of them. Look what time it is. I know what time it is. And these are just quick. And to be honest with you, they're common sense. How many of you know that we don't always do what's common sense? Let me just give them to you real quick. Number one, spend time with God every day. Make it your goal to spend time with him every day. Will you ever miss a day? Maybe. But let that be the exception rather than the rule. It isn't just, well, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. That's my time with God, and I'll go back next Sunday. I'm going to spend some time every day with God. And don't get overwhelmed and condemned saying, well, the only way I can do it right is if I spend at least an hour or two hours. Don't get that in your mind. Make it your goal to spend some time with God every day. But don't minimize it either. Just say, well, as long as I get up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord, instead of good Lord, it's morning, that I'm good. Okay? Make it significant. Spend time with God every day. When we talk about God's truth, number two, use a Bible you can understand. There's a lot of different translations that are out there, paraphrases. If you don't know what the difference is, it's not that significant, other than the fact that some are more accurate, some are more easy to understand, that kind of stuff. There's some you definitely want to avoid. If you want to know about those, ask me about that. But there's a lot of good translations out there. The most well-known is the King James Version. That's a great translation. It's a little harder to understand today for some people because it uses Old English, but it's still a great translation. But there's others that are really good too. And the important thing is, is that you choose a translation, a version that you can understand. I don't mean you're going to pick it up and understand every little detail because I don't even do that. But at least you understand the language. You understand what's trying to be communicated. So use a Bible you can understand, whether you actually have a printed Bible, use an electronic Bible. Yeah, so we are so blessed 
We can have our Bible on our phone, on our tablet, on our TV. We can have it on all these things, and they all sync together. And you know, all, it's wonderful. To be honest with you, it's left us without excuse. So we said, "But I don't read very well." Well, listen to it. You used to be you had to go out and buy a set of tapes. And you all remember what cassette tapes are? Young people are like cassette tapes. What are cassette tapes? You're going to even buy eight-track tapes. <laughs> anyway, you know. But nowadays, you know, you had to go out and buy this whole set for a hundred and something dollars. You got the whole Bible you can plug into it. No. So many places you can just call up any passage of scripture and it'll be read to you. Spend time with God every day. Use a Bible you can understand. Number three, start where you can understand. When you're first getting started, don't start in Leviticus. The people that are laughing have read Leviticus. Leviticus is important in God's plan for his people, but when you're just getting started, don't start Leviticus. And, and when you get to those so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, feel free to skip those. Now, they're important for what they were written for. Feel free to skip them, but start where you can understand. For a new believer, a great place is to start with the stories of Jesus' life, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A very practical letter that's very easy to understand is the letter of James. You know, it's great to start reading the Psalms because it's very emotional and it's, it's very expressive and it's easy to relate to those things. The Proverbs are great. Most of them you can understand. Maybe some of them are like, I don't know exactly what they mean by that, but they're giving practical wisdom for life. And, and if you're like, I really want to get into this. I don't really know exactly where to start. That's where you should start. You want to talk to me about it? You want to talk to my wife, Pastor Janet, Pastor Nate, one of our elders? Feel free, talk to somebody else you know that knows the Lord and they've been in it for a while. They can help you find those best places to start, but start where you understand. And as you go through, there's gonna be stuff you understand, then you hit a verse or a paragraph. Like, I don't know what that's talking about. Pray about it, do some research, but don't let that slow you down. Don't let that stop you. Number four, begin with prayer. God wants to speak to you. He's gonna use his word. Say, God, speak to me. Help me to listen. Help me to hear. Open my eyes to see. Number five, be consistent and persistent. Don't give up. You know, some people treat spending time with God and his word like a diet. They get all enthused about starting a diet and they stick to it for a couple of days, a week, maybe a little bit longer, and then it's over. You know, get, get off the wagon. It's like, why bother trying? It's, I can't... You know, be consistent, be persistent, don't give up. Even when you have those days that you spend that time with God's words, like, man, I don't even really know if I got that much out of it today. That's okay, you're gonna have days you may feel that way. Sometimes it's because we've allowed ourselves to get distracted. That happens to me. I can't tell you, there's, there's times I'll sit and I'll read my Bible, and at the end of it, it's like, what did I just read? I'll be honest with you, when that happens to me, what I do is I say, you know what? I need to go back and read it again and pay attention. Say, God, please help me to focus on this. Help me not just to read it and get it over with because that's one of the things I do every day. But the thing is, is that even if you have a day where it's like, I just, I really try, but I just didn't get that much out of it. It's still at work in your life. You know, we eat how many times a day? Depends on the person, right? Some people, you know, we talk about having three good meals a day. Some people have five. I don't know. Some people may only do one. I've known some people like that. But we eat every day. If we don't eat, we die, right? And the same thing is true for God's word. We need his word on a regular basis or we'll begin to die spiritually. And just because we had a meal we didn't care for or just because we had a meal that got a little burnt or it wasn't cooked well enough or it wasn't my favorite, I'm not going to quit eating. Same thing is true for God's word. Be consistent and persistent. Number six, be systematic. What do I mean by that? Be organized. Don't just sit down and say, where am I going to read today? And just pick your Bible up and open it up and say, ooh, there, I'm going to read that. And read and then close it. And the next day you pick it up. You know, you need to read things in context. Work on reading whole books. Work on reading whole chapters. Work on reading whole letters because that, that one particular verse, it's in the context. And it's in that context you're going to really understand it. You know, some people make it a goal to read the whole Bible in a year, and that's a great goal for people that don't like to read or have a hard time reading. It's very difficult, but it's also very doable if you know how to read. You can read the whole Bible in a year if you just read for about 15 minutes a day. If you're a relatively whatever reader, you may be a little slower than others. It's just getting down to doing it. And I'm not setting that up as a goal for you. I'm just saying that if, if that kind of rings a bell for you, try it. 
The important thing, though, is being consistent and being systematic and not just kind of jumping around all over the place. Number seven, dig deeper. Dig deeper. Sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, as long as you're getting into, you may only read one verse a day and that's good enough, you know. That may be where you need to start. I don't know, but dig deeper. You know, again, something like that is like, well, you know what, I'm just going to have a little snack every day. You know, I think today I'll just have a handful of peanuts. I've got to be healthy, so tomorrow I'm going to have one helping of cauliflower. And the next day I'm going to have four ounces of steak. Sounds good. But if that's all you eat each day, day some more healthy than others you're not going to live off of that you need more than that don't buy into the lie that as long as i just spend a minute or two with god i'm going to be good okay just kind of give a nod to god all right well i told you i'd go through this quick so let me give you the last one number eight and this is last on purpose take advantage of other sources of the truth the primary source of the truth is god's word and we should always go there first, primarily, and the biggest doses of it. But there are great books that are written by solid Christian preachers and teachers that you can read and gain benefit from. There are some YouTube videos that you can watch. You've got to be very careful. There's a lot of false teaching out there, things that are not agreed. That's why God's word has got to be first, God's word, because you've got to be able to recognize false teaching when you see it. But there's other resources that are available. We have right now media at our church that we make available to anybody and everybody that wants. It's called the Netflix of Christian Bible Study. If you don't know what it is, talk to me about it. I'll be glad to get you on that. All right, I gotta wrap this up. When you spend your time with God, I wanna encourage you to focus on three questions. This is what I do. It doesn't make it perfect, but it corresponds with these three things we were talking about. Learn the truth, live the truth, and love the truth. Three questions. Number one, what do you want me to know? Questions to ask God. So you sit down with God's word, you're reading it. God, what do you want me to know? What is it you want me to learn, okay? This has to do with the, the learning, the, the knowledge. What do you want me to know? But don't just stop there. Go to the second question. Lord, what do you want me to do? This has to do with the living. How should this change my life, okay? What should I do? What should I not do? And not just actions, but character. Lord, how can I change, to be that man or woman of God you want me to be. And the last one has to do with love the truth. How can I know and love you better? How can this time that I've spent with you in your word, how can that help me to know you and love you better? And I want to challenge you to ask those questions and don't give up until you have the answer. But that requires that you spend time with God's word and you don't just read through it to get it over with, but you think about it. It's a fancy word for that think about it. It's called meditation. So some people say meditation is an Eastern religion thing. No, no, it's a, it's a spiritual thing, yes. But when we talk about God's word, it means that you look at his word and you think about it. You chew it over. You, you, you say, how does this apply? How does this relate? What does this mean? I encourage you to do that. We see that the church grows strong as it's involved in a number of things. But the very, very first one is that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. I think it's first on purpose because it has to affect everything else. God's word is the foundation. You can grow strong. You will grow strong as you are devoted to the truth. Let's all stand together. Hallelujah. This is what we're going to do today. I'm going to invite our elders and our prayer team, Pastor Joel Sather here, if you want to come down front. We're going to be available to pray for you and with you if you would like that. Our worship team is going to lead us in some worship. And as we've been doing lately, I don't want to have any kind of official ending. I know we've gone a little bit later this morning. But what I want to do is I want to say a prayer that God will help us. This is one of those messages that you can say a prayer to commit yourself to do better and you probably should do that. I know I've been saying some too, you know, about what I want to do, what I need to do. But it really goes out, comes, comes down to going out there and just doing it. Putting into practice what God's laid on your heart. And I challenge you to do that. So what I'd like to do is just lead us, or lead in prayer. Say, God, help us to apply it. And then the worship team is going to begin to sing. 
And I just encourage you to spend some time in God's presence before you leave. And leave whenever you want to leave. If you want or need prayer for yourself or someone else, come. We'll be glad to pray for you. If you want to find a place to pray right where you are or come down front, be by yourself or kneel somewhere or whatever, I encourage you to do that. But once I've said this, once I've led us in prayer, once you're ready to go, you can feel free to do that. But please, spend some time responding to what God has said to you today. God, we thank you for your presence with us today. God, as I alluded to earlier in the service, things got a little confusing at first, at least for me, and seemed like some spiritual opposition. And God, I know you're always wanting to speak to us. And I pray, dear Lord God, that your message today would find fertile soil in our minds and in our hearts. And that you'd speak very clearly and specifically to each of us about how we can apply this message today so that, Lord, we can please you and love you and and grow closer to you and be a better witness to our world. And God, I pray that as we leave this place and we've got in our mind or we begin to get that as you speak to us about what we should do, give us the determination, Lord God. We talk about being devoted to something, committed to, passionate about, willing to sacrifice for. Lord, may we be committed and passionate and willing to sacrifice to spend time with you every day. And as we do, Lord God, I pray that we begin to see the results. That just helps, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to know how to apply this. God, I pray as we go from this place today that we would realize we're going out into a world that needs Jesus and that we'd be willing to be used by you to touch them for you. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I encourage you, spend some time in God's presence before you leave. Come if you need prayer or want prayer for anything. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just, I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to see.
Jesus, you don't know Jesus, me. Jesus, you don't know me anything. anything. More than anything that you can do, I just want to. Nothing else will do. 